Stealthy, precise, and deadly, the modern image of ninjas portrays them as hyper-acrobatic men in black who can defy every odd to eliminate their target. Whether working in unison or alone, ninjas can use shadows and deceit to get close to the target and then finish them in a cold-hearted manner. Skittering over rooftops, jumping from the shadows, and using unconventional weapons, ninjas are perceived today as some sort of ghost warriors that are devoted to a cult-like organization. But how much of it is the truth? Were ninjas really this deadly back in the day, or rather more prone to death? Welcome to Nutty History, and today, let's find out how dangerous the real lives of ninjas were. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. In the year 1562, Japan was burning. From the 15th to 17th century, political unrest and civil conflict marred the land of the rising sun. Back then, Tokugawa Ieyasu was a minor Mikiwa daimyo whose family, including an infant son, were captives of the Imagawa clan. However, Tokugawa had no leverage against the Imogawa warlord to get his family back. Tokugawa knew that Imagawa clan's defenses were too strong for a frontal offense. Ruse and sleuth were required to rescue his family, and in desperation, Tokugawa decided to strike a deal. The alliance with another clan was not only a waste of time, but a dangerous prospect. All of Japan was rife with hundreds of tyrants fighting each other for the throne of Japan. Moreover, if the news of Tokugawa allying with another samurai clan reached Imagawa, Tokugawa's family could be in danger. So, he chose another option. Instead of samurai, he asked another kind of warrior for help. These warriors weren't loud and boastful like samurai, but were known for their cunning, courage, and covertness. Tokugawa carved a coded request on a tree in the woods and returned home. A few days later, he got a reply of acceptance. The responder to the call for help was the shinobi. To accomplish the task of rescuing the Tokugawa family, Shinobi or ninjas would have to slip in and out of the castle of the Imagawa clan undetected. Getting caught meant only one thing, losing their lives. Unlike what Hollywood movies have told us, Shinobi didn't dress in black attires on missions. In fact, most of the time, Shinobi wouldn't try to dress differently than common people at all. Instead, they would try to blend in by disguising themselves as a priest, a minstrel, a merchant, or maid. Shinobi would plan their missions carefully. They would send scouts first to find the weak spots of the target. Then there would be a distraction, such as setting a section of the inner courtyard on fire that would appear accidental. While the guards would be busy tackling the ablaze mansion, the Shinobi would attract the hostages without making a sound. It sounds easy, but one slip-up was enough to cost Shinobi their members and Tokugawa his family. The young man who led this mission for Shinobi was a 20-year-old, Hattori Hanzo. Later, he would also save Tokugawa Ieyasu's life and then help him unify Japan under his rule. This was the golden age of shinobi, but it also brought them out of the shadows and nearly forced them to extinction. The Sengoku period saw the rise of shinobi clans and reached their most prominent era during the entire Japan history. Formalized under the Daisuke Tokagure and Kangdoshi around the 12th century, there were a total of 49 shinobi clans. Among these schools, Iga and Koga clans became the most important and successful of shinobi. They both were located near Kyoto, but also far enough to be remote. Ninjas may have originated to protect the poor, but to finance their resources, they had to earn money as well. This is why shinobi clans would perform mercenary jobs. The samurai code Bushido, forced samurai to adhere to a constraining set of rules which didn't always work in their favor. In such scenarios, they would often hire shinobi to clean their dirty laundry. Ninjas mostly carry out missions about extracting secrets, eliminating rivals, planting misinformation, or taking close relatives of the target for ransom. Similar to how not everybody working for a secret service in present times has a license to kill, not all shinobis were trained in the deadly skill of exterminating their targets. The word for that skill in Japanese is Kira, or Kuroshiya, not Shinobi. Ninjas were supposed to be stealthy, not deadly. A Shinobi skills were primarily focused on infiltrating enemy camps, collecting information, 
and sabotaging their efforts. Only a few of them were trained to take lives. But the most proficient skill of a shinobi was knowing how to escape any situation. They were trained to fight, but to execute their mission from the shadows and run. This is why being a shinobi was a dangerous affair, because a single mistake could lead to your death. Or worse. It's safe to say, ninja services were not cheap. Hattori Hanzo, who is considered the greatest shinobi ever, was also one of the most expensive shinobi in history. In the present world, his earnings would have been over 8 million US dollars. By working for samurai and tyrants, Shinobi also helped bring wealth from rich to poor, reducing the deficit. Ninja played a key role in the Nanpokucho Wars and the Onin War in the 1460s. But the Sengoku period was their golden era, with every samurai asking for their favor as civil unrest consumed the land. Their influence in the destabilization of many tyrants put the limelight on them. Shinobi means the one who lurks in shadows, but now they were out in broad daylight. And tyrant Oda Nobunaga saw them as a threat when he emerged as an early prominent power around 1560. As Iga and Koga were the most influential shinobi clans, he focused his efforts to eliminate them and eradicate Japan of ninjas. His excuse to target these ninja provinces was that they were independent, self-governing, and democratic rather than ruled by a daimyo. The social mobility and equal opportunity for everyone in these provinces was anathema for Oda Nobunaga, who claimed that these lands were a mockery of Japanese society. In 1576, after Oda's rivals began to gather in Iga, Oda sent his son, Oda Nobuo, to seize the province. He succeeded in capturing Mariyama Castle in early 1579, but his plan to fortify it failed spectacularly. Shinobi from Iga posed as laborers and infiltrated the construction work. On an opportune night, they burned the castle to the ground. Feeling humiliated, Oda Nobuo attacked Iga immediately. His 12,000 warriors launched a three-pronged attack over the major mountain passes in eastern Iga in September 1579. Hattori Hanzo was waiting for Oda forces at Isaji village with 5,000 Iga shinobi. He ambushed them from both back and front, blocking any chance of retreat. When shinobi attacked from shadows and covers, Oda Nobuo warriors were sitting ducks in the open, and fog and rain didn't help them either. Shinobi took care of the majority of the enemies with fire arrows and then dealt with the remaining with swords and spears. Many Oda warriors also died due to friendly fire as well. Somehow, Oda Nobuo survived the decimation of his army and managed to return to his father. Furious, Oda Nobunaga launched another attack on Iga province on October 1st, 1581, but this time with 40,000 men. The Koga clan had already fallen to the Oda army, and this time 4,000 Iga shinobi were facing a 10 times larger army. But the biggest shock was to learn that many Koga shinobi joined Oda's army as well. With all odds against them, Iga shinobi tried to defend their hilltop fort until the end, but they were heavily outnumbered. Oda's armies tried to leave nobody alive, but a few hundred managed to escape and scatter across Japan. Hattori Hanzo and his men also made it to the domain of Tokugawa Leisu, who welcomed them as he was preparing to rival Oda Nobunaga. This was the end of the unified ninja schools and their democratic system of auto-governance, but the shinobi tradition stayed alive with the survivors. Ishikawa Gomen would spend the next 15 years robbing daimyo, wealthy merchants, and rich temples. It is alleged that in a very Robin Hood fashion, he would share the spoils with impoverished peasants. Like Robin Hood, he also faced the garrote for his antics and in a rather horrid manner. Mochizuki Chiyome was a kunoichi, or a female shinobi from the Koga clan, who would take her last breath in the Battle of Nagashino in 1575. Now, During her life, she rescued girls from corrupt orphanages, wars, and brothels to train them in ninjutsu and turn them into kunoichi. At its peak, Chiyome's ninja band included between 200 and 300 women and gave the Takeda clan a decisive advantage in dealing with neighboring domains. Tokugawa Leisu unified Japan and established his shogunate rule to rule it in 1590. For the next two and a half centuries, Japan was peaceful and the shinobi were no longer required. Hattori Hanzo retired also and became a monk in his last years. But shinobi didn't go extinct as Oda Nobunaga had envisioned. Some opened new schools of ninjutsu, some became bodyguards, and some turned to banditry. 
But after 250 years of hiding, while their stories became legends and legends became myths, they were called back into service by Shogun Togugawa Yoshimine, who founded Oniwaban, Japan's first counterintelligence and secret service agency. Responsible for collecting information on government officials and daimyos, they would work undercover as bodyguards, gardeners, and other serving jobs in palaces. Still, that wasn't enough to save the thousand-years-old profession. Stability spread throughout Japan during the Meiji period, and demand for shinobi faded away. Tell us, in the comments, which other dangerous historical profession would you like us to cover? If you liked the video, do not forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching Nutty History.